Well, thank, thank you very much, Kim. I had some prepared remarks, but after that kind of introduction, I think I'm going to put them aside. Uh, one part of the uh, re prepared remarks was to s tell a personal story. I thought you might appreciate this because I think looking around the room, I think I'm probably older than everybody here, which is okay because I'm still alive. But uh, I want to go back to when I was at Stanford, and um, so that was in the 70s. Right? So my first computing class was, okay, how many worked with punch cards and Fortran? All right, so, all right, so maybe I'm not the, I'm probably in good company and just leave it at that. So now the computer comes out, and there was this thing at Stanford called the uh, Garage Club. You've heard of the Garage Club? Okay, so, you know, I went, and I'm sitting in the back, and there's this guy next to me named Steve. And, uh, you know, now, this is really where careers take different directions. <laughs> Let's just say I really didn't think this computer thing was going to go anywhere. <laughs> but what I learned from him was he was designing, um, you know, a little, little, like, miniature computer, obviously a personal computer, and he was just taking out transistors anywhere he could. You know, the... the Approach to optimization, I thought, was just so cool. And so that was my takeaway. What I didn't get is I missed the whole software revolution. So anyway, I go back, you know, in class, we go to these things, and it was just kind of fun. It was more of a social thing. Um, but a friend of mine came to me and said, you know, I think, what's this thing about educational software? Could we develop some educational software? This is for Microsoft and everything else, right? I'm thinking, well, that's pretty cool. I wonder if we could develop ways to do experiments online so you don't have to actually blow up the lab in chemistry, but you could get an idea of what would happen if you did mix these two th things together. And so I've been intrigued with this for well over 50 years, right? Um, so now we have the opportunity to do something about it, and I wanna, would like to first thank Kim for that introduction and also for all the organizers for this. This really is my number one priority. I mean, I, real, I talk about 10 priorities, like who can really have 10 priorities, so okay. News alert, there's really only three for me, and then my provost and the executive leadership team are not only engaged in these three, but also in the other seven. So the first one is clearly uh, spending time to hire great presidents. We had 12 openings this year when we started out, we filled two. We have three or four in, four in community colleges, so that's the local community council's job. So when you really narrow it down, there's probably five or six that are just very important, and the state operated in four or five in the community colleges. So that's a big deal. That, that I really believe strongly in recruiting as opposed to waiting to see who comes across the transom. So that's one vertical. Um, online is really the middle one and, and the big focus. So why is that? <clears throat> First of all, I think it's a great opportunity to take our mission to scale. Right? Our mission is to provide the broadest possible access to high quality education. And that's really what separates, in my mind, the online that SUNY does, SUNY Online, from any other provider. So broad access to high quality, that's really, really important. I think the um, second reason this is a high priority for Todd, myself, and for all you all, is if you look at our um, enrollment, at about 415,000 headcount, if you look at the demographics of, you know, I know that the provost went over this a couple days ago, uh, the, 14, the 18 to 24 year olds, you know, are going to be declining over the next four to five years. And so what I'm looking for is by SUNY at 75. This is going to become a big thing you're going to hear about. Uh, I haven't really talked publicly about this before this week, although I think I did say it in the SOTUS, but it's going to become a bigger, bigger deal. SUNY 75 is in 2023 and setting a goal, can we double or get on a path to double the number of uniquely online students that we have? Because as you probably saw, I will call it you know, the Larson, I, I need an alliteration here, but the wedge that you started to show, you know, the, the, the curve that shows the decline and then coming back up, there's really three pieces about that. There's international, which could be facilitated by online, there's out of state, and there's online. I mean, that's really what we're, 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 those are the three main pieces to build back our enrollment loss. So online features, you know, very prominently in, in that. And so we have set a goal over the next five years to get to 20,000, which would double the number of uniquely online students. I would like to give an action item to everybody in the room. If you have a program that's sitting at state ed to get approved for online, I need to know very soon 
because we need to move those programs through state ed, ed ASAP because when you think about the coronavirus, what is every university in the world doing, including what we're looking at? Uh, SUNY Korea, been in touch with their president. They're doing several things. They delayed class start. They're moving all the classes that can be moved to online. So now if we don't have those programs accredited and this lasts for a little while, that's a problem. So I think we need to immediately try and move those programs through state aid. Uh, but that's what most um, universities are doing. If they aren't bringing the, the, the students back, which we're not giving direction right now, we're, we're engaged with Department of Health. I want to say a few words about that. In order to, to have our students uh, be safe, that's our, our biggest priority, our students, faculty, and staff safe. Part of that, and also not disrupting our educational enterprises, is to, is to go online. So we're looking um, to try and move that, so let me know about that. I, coronavirus, it will, um, online will help us continue to operate as a university through this, this trying and very fluid time. So, um, you know, and I think, so those are all the sort of pragmatic reasons. Yes, we want to expand in new markets. Our uh, Open SUNY, from what I've learned, has been mainly serving, let's go back to the, the software analogy. So, you know, okay, so those of us who did punch cards and eventually we got the PC and then eventually we got laptops and portability and then we got the cloud. Even though the cloud was anticipated back in 68, you know, really was the last 10 years. When we think about uh, on-prem, that would be computing on-prem. I think about classrooms as on-prem. What online has done is taken our ability to do instruction to the cloud, right? So most of our students that are online are on-prem, and they're on the premises, they're already in the, the campuses. There are 40,000, you may have already heard this number, but 40,000 New Yorkers that we know of that are getting their online education out of state. And so if you, you listen to um, the governor's state of the state, and he talks about, you listen to the comptroller, and he talks about the same thing that I'm going to talk about right now, which is there is a tax differential between us and D.C. Now, I think that that's inevitable. You know, there's always, you're always going to have the stronger helping out the, the not as strong, right? We get that. But the question is, is 50 billion, on the order of 50 billion, 48 billion, 47 billion, is really that the right number? So I think about ways to let's not send more money out of state. Let's, let's develop a robust online program so that the New York students and citizens that are here can get their higher ed, higher quality education from SUNY, from the state of, in the state of New York. So, that, so those are all really good reasons to do what we're all doing. But I, I, I want to say something else. And this is, um, I'm an engineer, but I did a lot of work in materials particular type of materials, liquid crystal materials like, you know, we have all in front of our laptops. So what I recognize is that materials are made of atoms and molecules. And those materials, and I'm going to take a page from David Needham's, a former colleague of Todd and mine. So materials can have properties. Properties really come from structure. Structure takes a form of the materials that then have a function. So materials, property, structure, form, and function. Let's think about the classes we teach. They're comprised of atoms. Atoms are maybe little, little, little nuggets, if you will, within the lecture that you, you really want to communicate. You might think of a course as the molecule. You might think of how you put these molecules together to create a material, the structure of that course, the form, the function that allows the students to take that course to be and live in the world. So if you think about that a little bit, I think some of the exciting things that we can do as a system, and I don't know how to do this, so I'm counting on all, all y'all to do this. That's plural in North Carolinian terms. <laughs> all y'all can help us with uh, the ability for, we're already getting requests for a program on quantum computing and quantum communication. There's like 35 faculty throughout SUNY that do work in this area. And they've come to us to say, can we provide a program that's a SUNY program taking all of us working together in our particular area of quantum that we want to teach uh, a program uh, that would span the system. Now, let's put aside all, all the, okay, how do you get it accredited at middle states? How would you do this state ed, blah, blah, blah. But it's sort of an interesting idea. One of the first places that I went when I became chancellor was Geneseo. Anybody here from Geneseo? All right, there you go. <laughs> Oh, all right, excellent. So a math professor who was part of the um, faculty governance was, was there, met with the president, and meet with their staff, and the executive leadership team, and meet with the faculty governance. Uh, he asked me the question, 
could we teach differential equations with multiple colleagues across the system? Could we put together, like, I really like this particular type of the differential equations. It's called boundary conditions. But I know a colleague that is really an expert in the impact of initial conditions. Now I'm really making all this up. But it was something like that. And you start to think about, could you put together courses from the molecules and the atoms where you have best in class? And I don't know the answer to that either. The last thing I would challenge is we have, what, 7,000 courses? Five or 7,000 programs. I mean, it went thousands. Well, actually, probably 50,000 courses, 7,000 programs. Pardon? 24,000 course sections. Oh. Okay, and that's a subset of what SUNY as a whole teaches. Okay, so imagine you are an 18-year-old trying to come to school and figure out what do you want to be, what can you do, right? So now with the online, can we figure out a way to help those students find their path, predict their future, and navigate SUNY by enhancing our online presence, which may or may not involve, per se, instruction, but might involve assessment tools, might involve you know, pathways that we create. So I think that if we put in place, and now I get to the challenges of doing what we want to do, that a rock solid technolo technological platform that spans SUNY, where we can follow a student, whether they're taking a course at Geneseo or, or Brockport or Stony Brook, and still advise them because we can see their progress in all these different areas, use that progress to match them to future employers and opportunities and continue from a cloud to update what they know by what our research tells us about that particular subject so that they can continue to be successful. So when we think about what you're, what you're helping create, it's more than just facilitating instruction. It's the opportunity to really help students be productive throughout their whole life. And I think that sort of reinvents um, the relationship from our alumni to, to SUNY, which I think could be very productive. Let me just end by saying a couple things, and then if there, we have time, um, maybe answer a few questions. I think some of the challenges are getting to scale. So I've been talking, we've, we've all been talking, I've recently been, been talking with individuals who have actually done online at scale. Uh, and what they say is nobody has done online at scale. And they say maybe SUNY is the one system that could really make that happen. The reason you want to get to scale is right now the cost of advertising and acquiring students is so great. And when we look at the price point of our tuition, because we are pretty affordable, it doesn't work unless we get to scale. So does anybody know how much the average is? The average student pays Google, Instagram, Facebook, and anybody else, TikTok, to advertise. Anybody have a guess? It's like five grand. And you consider that what not students who are online, they're not 100% online. They might be 50% online. You, our tuition is $7,070. So if they're just paying $3,500 a year and our acquisition costs are $5,000, and maybe they're on for a couple of years and then they go on-prem or they finish up and they leave, that doesn't pay for the instruction costs. That doesn't pay for the technology. It doesn't pay for the coaching. It doesn't pay for your all time. It doesn't pay even for the renting of this, this space, which, of course, we gave it to you for free. So um, <laughs> that is sort of someone someday will write an article about that. But it's true. I mean, that's what's happening. And in fact, I even see it now. The other day, I was looking for healthcare programs online. So I put in, OK, I'll start out with our healthcare campuses. I put in Downstate Health Sciences University. And what popped up first, do you think? Uh, it wasn't, but you're on the right track. It was, I think it was, uh, wasn't Penn State Global either, but Purdue Global. It was like, and, you know, I, I had to go to the second page to get to downstate. That's the problem. Now I've got to pay more, then they're going to pay more, and then you get into this arms race. So I think the future and what we need to do when we address this is proprietary pipelines, right? Now we are the fourth most populous state. We have 300,000, I think, individuals in civil service. We should be able to create a proprietary pipeline. We have in the central region of the state of New York, and I've met with their chamber of commerce and five of the presidents in the central region. So whether it's ESF or Onondaga, Oswego, <coughs> upstate, 
uh, et cetera, empire, those places, their presence came together. And we heard from the Chamber of Commerce, they have 5,000 jobs that are unfilled. So why don't we create our own job board and just connect the dots so that students will come to us if we can do that gap analysis between what's their background and what are the needs of the company. That's, so when we think going forward of what we need to do to help you and your enterprises, I, we need someone that runs SUNY Online, gets up every day, that's the only thing they think about. That is like the only thing I think about maybe until I hit the shower and then it's like coronavirus and it's this, that, and the other thing. And so, yeah. Okay, so that's the first. Second is um, we'll be looking for a director of marketing. We'll be looking for a director of, um, in, maybe it's enrollment and marketing. Do they go together? Yeah, okay. And uh, business development, trying to create these job boards. So we'll be looking to invest three or four positions in this area. Um, we're fortunate because the system already has in place a bunch of the verticals. I mean, if you go on Southern New Hampshire University's website for, you know, they have 17 different vice presidents. Well, we don't need 17 vice presidents. Great. We already have a general counsel. We already have a provost. We already have human resources. We have a lot of the, the details that we already, um, that they had to hire, you know, from scratch. We have the campuses. We have your teams. So we just got to figure out how do we take advantage of all this wealth uh, in a very efficient way. So opportunity is if we can add 10, uh, 20, pro get to a point where we're adding 20 unique programs that on average are attracting hundreds of students, we can get to 20,000 in five years. That's good, that's our goal. Now Kim, I thought the story you were gonna say about Hopkins was not the, the data analytics, but it's actually, so there's a gal that worked there, it was fabulous, Sarah Steinberg, if you've ever run across her, I don't know if you know her, but she's great. She, back in the, you know, in the, the first part of this century, like, you know, 2007, 2009, she had 3,000 students online, and she had professors all over, the, all over the world teaching. So I walked into her office one day, and I said, Sarah, what would it take to get to 30,000? She said, you need to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I've recently seen, I think she's with a company now, and I forget, it's a, a company where she's doing exactly that. So I thought it was, it was a very cute story. That's the story I thought you were going to tell. So anyway, mostly I just wanted to say thank you. This is like my highest priority. This is, I think, very important for really taking our mission to scale. So thank you. Any questions um, that I heard you were a very verbal group, so I'm <laughs> I would like to say I love the the uh, the shirts and also the uh, I took one of the mugs home in full disclosure, so I have a, a mug at home that was really really clever, very nice. Yes. Hi, Sean.
No, Sean, thank you. I, that's exactly right. I mean, they, and I think that's the reason why SUNY Online is something that's perfect for the, the system to help drive because the kind of investment, it's an on, on the order of 100 million, right? On the order of, you know, more than 50, more than, I guess more than 30 is on the order in exponential sense, but it's, it's 70 million or more. It's probably more than any one campus would, it might not be more than any one campus that the university center could invest, but probably more than they would invest. And it's a, a risk investment profile. And you're, and the other thing that, that you all may know, um, certainly Sean, I know you would know this, that um, after 2028, Oracle's not gonna support PeopleSoft anymore. So there are a lot of, I mean, we've gotta figure out for the campuses that are, that are supportive of that and on PeopleSoft systems what we're gonna do and 2028 may seem like a long ways away, but when you start to do the backward stair step towards procurement and deciding what we're all going to do and the cost and pulling the trigger and rolling it out so that we don't, um, I have been, uh, I've come into a university that I uh, didn't do the rollout in a way that um, gave people training and it just popped up and that's gonna, we cannot do that. That's really bad. So anyway, thank you. It's it's right around the corner. Yes. Hello. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Eileen Worley. I'm the CIO at Monroe Community College. So we're kind of budding up here. But my question is not about technology. I think one of the things we found at Monroe is that one of the biggest barriers are cultural barriers and the way it's always been done and the perception of faculty. So I don't know if there are any initiatives going on on that side to kind of make people understand the imperative here and that the world, I mean, we I've seen so many presentations in regard to SUNY Online that the world is changing in all these different ways, demographics and our adult student population and the challenges and I think we're doing all the right things, but we have put into place barriers to, to, to Sean's point, to all students in terms of developmental, developmental education and testing and making sure our students are college ready and I think we're trying to flip that to make sure that our colleges are student ready. So I didn't know if you had any comment on that. No, Eileen, um, Eileen, right? Yeah. yeah. So great point. Um, I know the provost has an advisory committee that was comprised of faculty t and staff, right? And staff to work through some of the cultural perceptions around um, this change. And, you know, I think there's some other things that we need to look at pretty quickly, going back to technology just for a minute. We have an open SUNY platform, and now we're building SUNY online. And the open SUNY needs to be merged in, and it needs to be one platform quickly. Um, so, you know, I think cultural, what, what I've learned uh, in the two and a half years I've been chancellor is that I, if we get together individuals uh, that are willing to try something new and they're successful, then more people come on and then more people come on. I mean, you look at all the, the SUNY Achieve, uh, the co-requisite model, it started out with a few campuses and then grew to 10 and then grew to 20 and now there's like 47. So it takes a little time and it takes uh, just sticking with it and it takes individuals like yourselves that are willing to come together, do the hard work and be successful to bring everybody else along. Because you know, change, change is hard, without a doubt. Um, so I think that's part of it and I think it's the work that you're doing here that really helps move that forward as well. I think the other thing is education. So the reason why I say things like every student that is online has paid one of the major digital media advertisers five grand is to let people know there are real costs involved in trying to take this to scale and that any one campus probably can't do it by themselves. And if you want to take advantage of the wealth of SUNY, then you really need a platform that spans all of SUNY from the, both the technical and the student information systems. And we have what, you probably heard this from the provost, presentation of 42 instances of banner, 47. Yeah, uh, on the order, I mean, and so that makes it a little difficult to create that sort of seamless, if you will, connection for students and faculty across the system. But, you know, I think we're fixing that, so. I, I think the other thing is one last thing. Um, you have, um, 
as you know, the president of the faculty senate for the community colleges is uh, Christy Fogel, who teaches online. And her stats course, I mean, apparently, Del you know, University of Delaware and others in the Northeast, their professors say, yeah, don't take ours. Just take it from, you know, Monroe Community College. So again, letting people know that this is a way to, again, expand our brand, expand our reach, expand our mission, is just, and show those successes. And right now, there's already campuses. This is the thing that I, I see where, again, I, I say this just in the interest of communication. Many of your campuses are already, or had been, negotiating with OPM's online program managers. So the split of the revenue there is 50-50. I mean, that's because they have to make a profit, right? So our split is we don't need to make a profit. We're going to turn those profits back to the campuses. So economically, it's a better deal, but it only works if we get to scale. Because, you know, it's sort of that there's this valley of death. It takes money to start these programs, so we're trying to find the resources to do the academic work, do the technical work, and, and then the students come. Well, that lag is when you either die or you make it through the desert. Right? We need everybody working together to get through the desert. And this is my mes message to the presidents. And so I think, you know, working on some of the other verticals that we haven't been as active in, for example, if we have 80% or roughly of our students are traditional 18 to 24 year olds, then we're really not looking at the non traditional students, the international students, the graduate students, the branded programs, the certifications. All those other verticals are fertile ground for us. And that's one way we can get to scale pretty quickly. At the same time, we've got to be mindful. We need incentives for the faculty because it, you know, more students, you need more resources to do a great job. And so I think that's where we need to hear what are those barriers and what we can do, you know, to put some carrots out there. Yes. Hi, I'm Hope from the Coil Center. Hi. And um, Hope Wendell, and I, I hope. love to hear what you said about um, creating a job board, and I would love to s also weave internships into that. Yeah, too. absolutely. And um, I know Perfect. at SUNY Ulster they had a job board, um, like a, a database kind of thing, and I wonder if there's a way to, I don't know, I'm looking to Harry and Israel that we can somehow bring all those wonderful job boards together to help. Um, I think that would be great hope. Um, yeah. So that's what I would expect the uh, director of the business development to work on. Now, who's hope in Israel? So I see faces. Harry. Harry I'm sorry. Harry. Your hope. Got it. <laughs> Harry. Great. I thought you might be Harry. And is Israel? Okay. Great. Yeah, I think that if we could get, if you could email um, either myself or Todd, you know, ask, uh, links or point us to the direction of where there are existing job boards. That's something that, mm -hmm. that I think would make sense to coordinate. Yeah, and also a couple of years ago, Alex had a great um, presenter who they were doing um, intern internships in connection with online um, programs. I can't remember. Yeah, which was amazing. So can, can I, if we could get that name too, that'd be great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Well, again, thank you for having me. Enjoy the rest. Oh, is there another question? Yes. Bruce Shelton, Director of Distance Learning at Sioux Poly. Just a quick question to go back to one of the first things you mentioned in your opening remarks. Uh, the pandemic, how and when would we, can we expect some guidance on how the people in this room are going to have to help our faculty get all of their materials online? So should something hit? Yeah. So um, can you say one more time? Uh, I didn't quite hear the one word. Uh, pandemic. The pandemic. Uh, pandemic. Okay. Uh, so I would like to know, like today, if you take a break, just email me what programs are sitting at State Ed to start, um, and then we will be giving guidance out to the presidents. We're actually sending out a notice today to all our presidents, and we're going to have a uh, all hands call. I believe on Monday, I don't know what time it is, but this is, um, and then during that call, I'm going to make the case for, look, this has got to be something that you pay attention to campus by campus to see what it would take to get, get your courses online. 
It's a great suggestion. I would not have been in that call without that, so thank you. I will make sure that's in our call now. Wonderful. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you. Enjoy the... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Not only am I old, I'm obviously blind, so my apologies. Sorry, can, because I'm small, you know, small thing, so... <laughs> Uh, I'm so. My name is Yun Kashu. I'm the instructional designer of the SUNY Morseville. I'm so glad to see you in the person because I have to write the IITG. So I see what your video won't have of time about the four things, you know. So um, my question is that um, so far, you know, uh, after we begin to move the online program forward, and so many students begin to select an online program, and they don't need to worry about their location or something. So for our small size, like a college, like a we all enroll the people uh, in our neighbors. But once they begin to find the online program in other, other place, how could we survive from the online you know, pro yeah. program you know, crash? No, it's Fabulous <laughs> to bring that up because that is exactly we were talking about this yesterday, uh, the provost and myself. So here's what we're thinking, and really like to get your input because I think this is sort of a key a key question. Let's go back to the assessment part that I was talking about a little bit. Didn't go into much detail. So a student comes online. We had uh, 25 million views for our 10 videos. Uh, we had then from people viewing those videos for SUNY Online about. I don't know, 2 million or, well, a lot of people click through, and then of those, maybe 40,000 ask for information. So there's a lot of people out there. Our initial pilot set of programs, uh, 20 programs at 10 campuses, was not enough to even uh, service all the interest for all those individuals. So we would then send them out to the campuses. And I think your question is, so how are they going to be sent to my campus versus someone else's campus? So what I think we need to do is come up with a, a, uh, a program because if we really grow to hundreds of thousands of inquiries, we've got to be able to address them very quickly or we lose them. So very quickly be able to assess a couple of what I would call principal components of the individual, right? So what I've been told, don't know if it's true, but you can tell me yes or no, that most of the folks who like to go get their instruction online are within 50 to 100 miles of their campus. So if you were designing a program that was going to assess which is the best SUNY for you. Now, have you ever been put on hold when you called SUNY and talks about, you know, want to be part of something bigger, which is great. I love that part. The next thing should be, and I think it is, we have a SUNY for you. Then the question is, well, which one? So we need to assess, come up with, and this is where we need knowledge from our faculty, our staff, and our students about how do we match them to a SUNY. So you have a number of programs. I would say if you can be thinking on your campus of what are the unique programs that you have. So Mor Morrisville State, I think you have the largest herd in the, uh, in the system, right, 200 cattle. So there might be something about animal husbandry that could be put online that would make sense for your faculty. I know you also have um, micro hydro and solar and micro wind uh, certification and credentialing. So again, that would be, so we need to understand at a very granular level, let's go back to those molecules, right, and then the structure, what is unique about a particular campus and how does that match the unique interests of the students? So one would be location, two would be uh, maybe something about their background. Do they already have uh, any college education under under their belt? Are they interested in the things that you're known for? So I think it's going to spark a conversation about creating uh, a real deep soul searching for our campuses and us as a system is where are we the best, where are we distinctive, and how can we brand that so that students know where to go and how to get that education. I think that's one. I think a second one is to look at programs. Uh, I had a presentation recently from a campus that, that did a two by two quad, and I would encourage everyone to look at this where it said, you know, most interest, fewest online programs, oversecting with, uh, intersecting, excuse me, overlaid with what we do on our particular campus. And that points to then the programs that I would encourage going online first. So I think there's a lot we have to learn. 
And I think um, it's summits like these that are going to bring people together that raise these issues, get people talking so that the more we communicate, the more we'll build trust. The more we build trust, we'll have a more robust system and we won't leave anyone out. I think that's the biggest thing is uh, it took me a long time to learn. I mean, Kim said I started out as an assistant professor at the University of Colorado. My, when I was assistant professor, the only thing I was like, get tenure, do your work, <laughs> show up at class, do your research. And you didn't have to tell anybody what you were doing. And then when I became dean, I now had a real boss that wanted to know, and I was constantly surprising the provost at Duke. If Todd's not laughing, see, he's, he's smirking because he knows this, right? But what I learned in government is that's the worst thing you can do to somebody. It's the same here. The worst thing we could do to anyone is to surprise them with what we're doing, which is one of the reasons I wanted to be here to talk to the group so that you know everything that I know or I'm thinking. <laughs> it only took a half an hour. Um, <laughs> on this topic. So I will, I think that was, a, you know, an excellent point and it'll keep it top of mind for all of us as we work through this. The good news is it's, we're not going to just overnight have, well, we could actually, we could have hundreds of programs online overnight, but if we do the work that you're doing here, we'll choose them in a way that's going to enhance uh, the individual campuses. And something that I said in my inauguration, and I'll say it again because I want you to hear it, it's easy to say the whole should be greater than the sum of the parts. Well, that puts all the onus on the parts to be part of the whole. But what's the responsibility of the whole to make the parts stronger? That's what we need at System to be mindful of every single day. So thank you. Wonderful last question, right? Yay. Wonderful first question. Too. Thank you so much, Chancellor.